afternoon. How is everybody? Good. <laughs> okay, let's go. Um, I'm from the University of Alberta, and I'm the ombudsperson there. So what I'm going to do is bring uh, the ombuds role and perspective on cyberbullying, and cover a little bit on cyberbullying forms, and introduce the importance of the Nova Scotia Task Force on Bullying and Cyberbullying, otherwise known as the McKay Report, and finally on to an ombuds roadmap to systemic fairness. So first of all, with the ombuds role, they differ very, uh, quite a bit on campuses across Canada. But I would say some of the key things that we are focused on is fairness and collegial relationships, promoting an organizational climate of positive change. We're very concerned about systemic groups of conflict. And we like to examine uh, problems such as cyberbullying in terms of the social relations and the impact on the entire uh, university community uh, because we're focused on promoting a university not only that has fairness but in policy but in its reputation of, of administering that policy and of course we want to create a roadmap that includes collaboration to explore every option to stop cyberbullying and to promote some cyber kindness. The Ombuds does not have any sort of executive power. It's all about moral suasion to do what is right and what is fair. And so when we look at systemic roots, I've just pulled some examples of systemic roots here because I think Nambuds use a more holistic approach in examining contributing factors. And they can be things like organizational tolerance of these kinds of problems, either through active or passive kinds of neglect. And balance of power, of course, there's always institutional hierarchies. Another one is focusing purely on the perpetrator and victim and ignoring all the other dynamics related to cyberbullying, including bystander occlusion. Uh, the organizational climate that manages through fear, ridicule, and that again would enable this kind of behavior. And again, inappropriate kinds of collegial relationships that try to cover themselves up under the guise of academic dialogue and competition. And of course, we may have all kinds of historical and current systemic inequalities, and they can vary from institution to institution. So the cyberbullying at post-secondary, there's things that I started to see about five years ago in my work as an ombuds person, and they're increasing. And what we see more and more of, I think, is related to the fact that there are more online courses and increased usage of social media. And so, as a result, conflicts in and outside the classroom in all, and I say university-related activities, are increasingly online. I specify university-related activities because a lot are off-campus. Uh, typical examples we see in classroom projects, professor-student emails, unwanted sexting, student group conflicts, and a big one, uh, because I see a lot of grad students, is supervisor-grad-student conflict as well. And some of the forms of cyberbullying, there are typical ones that you see in the list of cyberbullying ones, and I've listed them here, I'm not gonna define them, but the flaming, the harassment, denigration, even impersonation, which is important to look at, trickery, the outing, and exclusion of others, and finally, the cyber stalking. And there is a specter of cyberbullying. One of the things about it, it's very menacing, very destructive, and 24-7 um, meaning uh, spreading constantly to others. And of course, we don't know how many people are seeing it because it becomes, it moves very rapidly. So we have an infinite number of people. And as stated by previous speakers, there's no such thing as a safe space because it's very invasive. And the anonymity thing can often be a huge factor here. And of course, the message is always irretrievable. So I wanted to mention the K report. Uh, I was at an ombuds conference in Halifax last June, and this was there was a very significant follow-up on this at the ombuds conference. And this was Justice McKay's report following the suicide of Rotea Parsons. There was a huge Nova Scotia task force on bullying and cyberbullying. And what's important in that report is that it examines the social context of bullying and cyberbullying. 
Oops, jumped ahead there. Um, he found the bystander's role is very critical so that if you look at any definition of bullying, cyberbullying, look at those as well who assist or tacitly permit the cyberbullying and bullying. And his recommendations, I think, are quite comprehensive, devise and implement a system of mechanisms to hold people accountable for their behavior. At the same time, treat each incident as an opportunity to teach pro-social skills. This is about communication. And build capacity for empathy and emotional awareness. And connect with all the support services you can whenever necessary. And again, something very important for ombuds and human rights um, organizations and, and units. To task arm's length, sorry, arm's length agencies such as these uh, to deliver education programs and resources uh, for people to learn to be responsible and respectful and use uh, electronic media safely. And I can certainly say that uh, the Office of Safe Disclosure and Human Rights at the University of Alberta has been very proactive in their approach to this. So it's a reframing of the notion of cyberbullying so that it's just not about the perpetrator and victim, that you look at bystander compliance as well, and you move away from this kind of rigid binary relationship to more of a socially dynamic model, and it examines relationships so that no excuse such as, I didn't think, I didn't mean to, I was too scared to report it, um, is appropriate and rather looking at it from what McKay called a reasonable perpetrator perspective. And what this does is it makes everyone responsible for the change that is inclusive education. So his action plan, again, you can start with the zero tolerance from the top down, uh, and a right from the university from the president, no, no cyberbullying, no tolerance signs, of course, all the information about the legal aspects. Yeah, it does have a mind of its own. That's okay. I can turn it back. I can control it. Um, and then progressive discipline to participants in cyberbullying. So this is looking more to uh, restorative justice models where harms are identified to make individuals responsible and not just that pure punitive kind of situation. Uh, promoting what he called netiquette and cyber kindness empowering youth to be good cyber citizens, and basically educating about online safety, privacy protection, so inform yourself about what is happening when you're online. And he came up with this notion of digital literacy and citizenship courses, kind of like learning reading, writing, arithmetic, the new uh, kind of uh, reading, writing kinds of courses that you need for learning how to use your social media. And here's a nice little, uh, sign up, looking at a culture of cyber kindness, but it focuses on connecting everyone in a respectful manner. Okay, so roadmap to potential solutions. All of us like to do roadmaps, examining what are the underlying conditions, is there potential for dangerous behavior, we're always having to look for that. Um, and. Are there any kinds of policies to apply? Um, who can you collaborate with? Okay. What is your role going to be in this process? And if you have a plan for systemic change, what is that new policy? What's the education plan? What's the enforcement plan? What are these going to look like? So again, what we do is look more closely at the policy and when we examine policy, uh, we, of course, make recommendations all the time. So, first of all, is the policy current? Is the terminology current? How often do you revise the policy? Is the information clear? Is it so embedded in policy that you can't find it? Is it a really narrow one, or does it examine things like systemic enablement? What kinds of support services do you have in place on your campus? Because if you don't have the support services, the policy is just way out there sitting by itself. And are the key stakeholders involved and are they actively involved in the implementation of that policy? And with the education plan in itself, does it promote a notion of cyber kindness, a new way of treating each other respectfully in the cyber world? And if you have all that, 
do you share your practices, your best practices, with other post-secondaries? I think that's it, and I'll just show my resources, of course. Thank you very much.